everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. We are really excited to be here today. We have an interview with one of our Hall Star actors. We are talking with actor Neil Bledsoe today. Ooh, and yeah. <laughs> yes. <That's laughs> and our job. <laughs> I am film critic Rachel Wagner. Cammie's here. Hi, everybody. He's taken away our cheering section job. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I do my own cheering. <laughs> oh. Neil, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, you you were one of the rare that actually sought us out and said, hey, I want to come on. This is great. It's <laughs> true. Well, look, guys, I'm never going to pass up a chance to talk about myself. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you. And duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> what we like to do is we like to start our interviews by asking our guests to introduce yourself and tell us what inspired you to become an actor. Oh, geez. I know, tough. Um, well, my name is Neil Bledsoe. Uh, my father abandoned me, uh, <laughs> you know, and I was forced to fend for myself. Um, I, what, what, what inspired me to first become an actor? Um, you know what? Like a lot of American families, like a lot of families all across the world, I think that I grew up around the television, watching movies, watching TV shows, and and that <laughs> that I think I identified at a very early age that everybody that my my brother and my dad and my mom and everybody in my family talked about and kept obsessing about was in that little television or was up on that movie screen. You know, so I kind of made the being the megalomaniacal child that I was, I made the connection. I was like, look if I'm you know and I was I was the youngest I was like my brother's almost 13 years older than me and he's my only sibling uh my father's kind of you know he's he's obviously older than I am and uh, and I made this connection that I was like all right I, you know I needed to find a way to to interject myself in the conversation to find to find a way that I could have some value and I think when I was young I was like all right I've got to try to be somebody that's on that screen or I got to mimic those people or I've got to, you know, I really, really loved Bill Murray films when I was young. And so I, I would try to do those bits or like in Living Color or Saturday Night Live. I was like, I was always mimicking those things in a way to kind of get attention. And what that did is it just kind of made me bolder and bolder. And I, I never really had that thing where I, you know, I had any fear. And so I just kept... I kept at it and uh, and then kind of I had this choice in front of me when I was a teenager where I was like, All right, my, what am I going to do? And I thought about going to college. And the only reason I could think about going to college was to, you know, join a fraternity and drink away four years of my life and then have the exact same questions about my life and who I was existing after, you know, Cammie knows what I'm talking about. Her four brothers know what I'm talking about too. Five. five oh, five brothers. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, when I, you were talking about trying to fit in, trying to find value, I'm like, man, did he bug my house or something? <laughs> I did. Cammie, I, I hate to, to tell you like this, but. Uh, wow. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that, being an actor like that is like we're we're always trying to we're always tr kind of like driven to be on stage and the way that I would always think about it is I lived in a very loud world and being on stage was the only place where it got quiet where and it's still my favorite thing about being on a stage or being on set is like the world slows down it stops and there's just you and a moment of time that is really thrilling and addictive. Um, um, and it's something that is like, it's indescribable. Like my favorite sound on earth is like being on stage and like, and having the entire audience waiting on your next word. Um, again, because I'm a big maniac. Uh, but there's just, there's something about a moment brimming with potential that I love. And I think as I, was really trying to fit in and find my place. That was what I kept coming back to. And I'd lost it in certain times, you know, like growing up in America with like, um, with people that are constantly, you know, kind of playing whack-a-mole with anybody that stands out. I was, 
I was odd and weird and like, uh, and I, you know, I, I wasn't quite the handsome man that you see before you. Um, I, you know, I like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like my first two jobs were, I were, I was a greeter at the Gap. And that was my first job that I ever had. And I was so hyperactive that they had to force me to be the greeter because if I was like folding clothes or if I was like helping people, I would just distract everyone because I wanted to like talk and like do. There was one time that the Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas came out and uh, I decided to, to greet everyone coming into the Gap like Johnny Depp doing Hunter S. Thompson. And I was like, hey, good God, man. Welcome to the Gap. Uh, are you looking for some chinos, maybe? Maybe a V-neck sweater. Yeah, something to look good on you, man. And, um, and but that was kind of like, I was just weird. I was a weird kid. And I was a weird kind of, and but there was something about how I grew up that was kind of like, made me think I needed to be normal. And so my second job, I worked at Abercrombie and Fitch and I was doing the exact same thing. And I was out there, it was like the silliest job I ever had. I was out there. You have a thing for clothing lines. <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, I'm a good dresser. But no, there but you like, go. <laughs> but there was something about Abercrombie and Fitch that was like, oh, this is, if I get this job, this makes me like a really attractive person. And so I was kind of, what I, my point is, is like I was trying to live from the outside in. I was trying to fit a form. And it wasn't until I was maybe about 19 that I was like, I really thought like, no, I, I've got something in me that needs to get out, that needs to be expressed. And I'm going to make a go of it and try to be an actor, which is a bit like throwing yourself out of an airplane. And uh, because you've got a lot of people that are telling you like, oh, well, you know, you want to be an actor. Okay, well, make sure you're okay with failure. You've got to face a lot of rejection. And it's, it's true, but it's like, I think if you reject the calling to it, uh, then you're you're living a you're living a doomed life. There's there's um, there's this great quote by Joseph Campbell about like the hero's journey, and it's um, it, it's about the, the call to adventure. And kind of part of this life is being called to it, being called to venturing outside of what's safe and what's known towards something unknown, some, something greater. And if you if in his Joseph Campbell's kind of the power of myth or the, the hero with a thousand faces, it said, if, if the hero refuses the call, then the hero lives a dead life. And that's not to say like, oh, I'm a hero, but it's like, it's a framework for everybody's life. And the way to think about it is like, think about Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. You know, of like Obi-Wan shows up, the droids, his Princess Leia. And the, if Luke had kind of gone, nah, you know, I want to go to Hitachi's power station to get some power converters with my friend and help Uncle Owen and Aunt Brew, like that's really going to be my life. Like nothing would have happened, right? And that's not- I've got to get home. I'm late enough as it is. You know? <laughs> so I, I think that that's in the, not to be too, not to be too uh, poetic about it, but it, like that's kind of how I was called to it. And then I found myself going to theater school and uh, New York City and started getting more work, which will always kind of make you feel like it's, it's somebody else thinks, hey, you're good at this. And that kept happening. So was that where you started your career then as in New York? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was. So I went to I went to a theater school in North Carolina called the North Carolina School of the Arts called now it's called the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. But excuse me. Um, I graduated in 2005 and uh, I got out and tried to, gosh, I, like I, I auditioned and I'm so bad in my first audition. So like when you get out, you go to this thing called the consortium and you audition and do these like acting scenes in front of all these agents and managers and casting directors. And, and if you do really well, you know, then you kind of get slotted and uh, with some really great agents and your career kind of takes off. I was so bad. First of all, I was dressed like I was in a salsa band. Like I should have had, I was like in an iridescent blue shirt with some like white slacks. And I was just had the worst scenes and nobody wanted me whatsoever, except for this one agency that doesn't even exist anymore called Top Cat Talent. And cat was spelled with a K and that's all you need to know about how reputable they were. And uh, I got- Hey, I out. like Ks. <laughs> K's are fine, not when they spell cat, though. Um, 
it was uh so yeah I, I got out and um i was i was here for from 2005 to 2013 and then moved to la to go get my own action figure and uh and then was and kind of have split my time between the two cities since did you remember that first role you ever got i do yeah it was 30 days out of school um it was called The Hunters. It was a pilot for Lifetime. Kelly Lynch was playing my mom. Um, and uh, I, it, it was also like the first kind of, you know, it was the first time we talked about that kind of rejection and the fear. Like my, my family, of course, when I graduated from, uh, from school, I think my brother pulled me aside and it was my brother and my dad and I were having dinner. He was like, what's your plan, huh? What's your plan? What are you going to do? What do you, what, what, what's your plan with this? And I was like kind of backed into a corner, but I think the assumption was, as it is for many people, that now that you've got this BFA, you're never going to work. And so get used to working in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I booked my first role and I was like, cool, I can do this. I can really do this. And so I felt really excited about it, but it was also, I was like 24 and I had like a, a chunk of money in my pocket. And so what's the thing that you do with the first time you have money when you're young? I spent it all immediately. I bought some like fancy furniture and then I didn't work again for another couple of years. And so I became a waiter with fancy furniture and, uh, um, and, uh, yeah, so that was, that was my first role though. It was a, it was a pilot for a lot of time. Super nervous. Was I nervous? When, yeah. When you, when you went to film your first role? No, I wasn't nervous. I just probably didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to work. Um, you know, because like when you, one of the things about going to theater school is like you don't really learn how to be on a set. Mm -hmm. You don't learn. Yeah, how to you learn work. how to be on a stage. Yeah, yeah, you learn how to work on a play with with a with a, an ensemble that wants you to succeed, with a, a teacher that is like helping coax a performance out of you. But when you're on a set, the demands are very very different, and so I and and also like you're working with a camera and you have to be subtle, which is still something I struggle with. And, uh, and I, I, I just don't think I knew what to do. And I, I remember looking at the pilot and feeling like, oh my God, I'm awful at this. Because like a lot of it, like I would sound like Christopher Walken in like oddly in some of the takes. I'd be like, wow, uh, that guy over there, he's been tracking pen pal for six months or something like that. And I was like, and the director would sometimes come over and be like, why do you sound like Chris Volk? I don't know. And I'm like trying things or like, I'll look at other scenes and I'll like, I'm squinting like Zoolander doing blue steel or something. I'm like, it's like incomprehensibly bad. And then there was one scene, one scene in the entire pilot that was any good. And I was like, Oh, that's how to act. And I was like, I was having fun. It was pursuing an objective. It was like, I just, so I like locked into it after two weeks of that I should have been fired for, but uh, it was, I remember just kind of feeling grateful, not nervous, but like really grateful to have the opportunity to work on something. So that's and, the scene that went on your demo reel. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then the rest of it is like the award winning, the hunters from Lifetime. And then <laughs> I check out this demo reel. Yeah. <laughs> So you were on Ugly Betty, and right. uh, so that must have been a cool experience. What was that like? Man, that was um, that was kind of my first break, really. Um, I remember. So actually, it was kind of like I had this succession of of roles that were kind of like back 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 to back to back. And when you're an actor, like there are so many great actors that you never have heard of, you know, that are like grinding away each and every day, that all they need is just one little break, somebody in the business to recognize their value. And I got one of those the first time. And it was for this, uh, I was on the Gossip Girl and I was playing this role that for whatever reason kind of caught fire in the zeitgeist. And I was in Entertainment Weekly three weeks in a row. And then I was in Perez Hilton and I was like, wow, I've kind of like, whatever has happened is like our, the arbitrary hand of fame and fortune has kind of landed on me for once. And it was just a little, little bit, but it was enough to kind of get some heat and momentum that right after that, I got put on this 
really terrible show about models on the CW called The Beautiful Life. And I was playing a Russian mobster. And I am, I know people can't see me through the magic of audio, but I am perhaps the waspiest looking person in the world in the fact that I was playing like Dimitri Kane or whoever I was playing. It was yeah. so bad, this show. And everybody who's made this show knows how bad it was. We were canceled in the middle of one of our scenes. I still remember that this like PA came in as I was like, talking to this girl who's going to play my love interest and the PA was uh, like on a walkie and she was like, okay, 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 okay. I'll tell him. Okay. 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 Hey guys, um, we have, we have, we're going to finish the shot we're on and then we have a half hour for lunch and then we have a half hour to get out of the building. And it was like, literally, that's how we were told that we were canceled. So oh, man, no, the, 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 the episodes that I, had shot, none of those saw the light of day, but that same casting director had this other role coming up in Ugly Betty. So I, he, this guy, uh, Jeff Sofer, who was like a really big fan, he used to work at ABC with the people that cast me in the, the first job I ever had. And, um, and he, he really fought for me to be on the show and, uh, and I booked it. And I was like, I can't believe it because Ugly Betty was like, that was the kind of role that I wanted to do. It was like the, the tone was like comedic. It was like dramatic. It was all over the place. And of course I got to meet one of my first mentors who was Judith Light. And I remember because Judith was playing my mother and it was her long lost son. It was Eric Mavius' long lost brother. Um, I, I, uh, I got a call from her and before I even showed up on set, she called me and for about 90 minutes, we talked about writing poetry. Um, she, I'd never been to Tuscany before, but she was like telling me stories about like what it was like to write poetry in Tuscany. Uh, the feeling of growing up somewhere provincial and getting out and like, and making your voice heard. And so <clears throat> the day, and I was living in Brooklyn Heights at the time, which is just across the Brooklyn Bridge from Lower Manhattan. And we were shooting in this bar that I was supposed to work at uh, in Lower Manhattan. And the first day I wanted to, I wanted to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge for my first day on set. Cause I was like, that's so perfect, right? It's just like, you gotta do that. And I was like- I think Symbolic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, I've arrived in Manhattan. <laughs> I think the theme from Working Girl was probably playing in my head. Like Harley Simon just blasting in my ears. Um, but I, I showed up and I was just like, I felt so comfortable. And that gift and the presence of, of Judith is like, I mean, there's a real difference when in this business because it's very hard and people are, are always kind of like in transition and nobody's like evil per se, but I think insecurity is something that runs rampant in this industry. And she was the first person that I ever met that really seemed I think truly at home and present enough within herself to be generous. And I, I was so struck by that example. And so when I got there as like a 26 year old kid or whatever, um, you know, she really made me feel comfortable and at home. And then, and then of course I got to work with Vanessa Williams and uh, I, I wanted to tell her how much I like, I, here, I gotta tell you this story. I had such a crush on Vanessa Williams when I was 13. And it was like, it was kind of like an adult crush. I knew that she was married and I knew that she had kids that were like three or four years younger than me. So my fantasy was that I was going to, I had to break her, her and her husband up. And, uh, and I would like, I would practice the speeches that I would tell her, her children about like sharing the Super Nintendo when I became their new dad. It was a very bizarre fantasy for like a, a in 12 year old kid. It was in depth. Yeah. Very in depth. <laughs> yeah, I would like sing like, sometimes the sun goes round the moon. Um, <laughs> like, you got a whole inner dialogue going on oh, yeah, here. Yeah, totally. But she was like, but Vanessa Williams, it was the most beautiful woman that I'd ever seen in my life. I was like, oh my gosh, look at this woman. So when it came time to like, do scenes with her. I was like, um, sir, where do you want to, yeah, do you want to rehearse this, Vanessa? But inside, I'm like, 
just singing <laughs> the sip and the best for last. So it's like, are you singing? No, 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 I don't. I think that's one of the crew had their phone on. <laughs> Weird. Um, well, speaking of Judith Light, have you gotten to see um, Tick, Tick, Boom yet? No, I haven't. Oh, she's it. so good in it. You got to see it. You'll love it. So- what yeah. before before we leave ugly betty one more quick question because a lot of our listeners myself included are really big postables big fans okay. of sign seal delivered so what was it like working with eric mavius he was so funny um <laughs> you know like uh, so much of our we didn't work together a lot because a lot of our storyline was about how how much in opposition and how much we hated right. each other and how much we couldn't stand each other. So, um, but there was this, I remember something very specific about Eric's like comedic timing and like his, he's a brilliant <laughs> clown in a way um, that there was this moment where I was like, you know, cause I'm, I'm like set up to kind of like everything that he finds hard to do, I can do really easily. Like, you know, I'm just naturally a model or whatever. And I remember him like like practicing this catwalk and doing this sachet, um, and then like spying on me from behind like a mannequin that was on wheels, and it was just like that is so so funny. But he was he was great, man. He was it was a lot of fun. And we were like, I literally had, had lost touch with him, uh, and only at Christmas Con did we reconnect. And it was just like so good to see him after so many years. Oh, that's right! I forgot you were at Christmas Con. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. I now he's you know he's got to sign, seal, and deliver me to to one of the postables, man. Yeah. I could be on it. Well, you were also on Smash. That's that right. seems like that must have been a fun show to be on. Yes, it was. It was um, it was a very fun show to be on. Um, you know, it was like a, I think Smash was. It was one of the first times that I'd seen, besides that in Sex and the City 2, um, that I was also in, it, it was kind of an experience in seeing how Hollywood builds shows and and the, the kind of circus that surrounds it. And, and there was like, I'm really proud of some of the work we did, but I, I, I don't think it's any secret that there was a lot of competing voices in the room. Um, and even some of the stage stuff I've, I've seen, uh, it's it's sometimes it, it's interesting to see that like some of the most talented people if they're not working together uh, will get in their own way of like a, of producing a really really great story um, and everybody kind of has to agree it's like hey we have to agree on what story we're telling here and sometimes it felt like you know I, I felt like on Smash, I was, I really loved the character that I was playing because I was just like, all right, I'm, I, I'm playing this, this man who doesn't know how, feels alienated by his own culture, uh, that doesn't know how to love and, and doesn't think at the end of the day, he might not be worthy of love. That's like a really brilliant kind of like very human thing to play and very human trait. And that's kind of what I glommed onto as a character. But by the end, I, I think what kind of they, they wrote my character into a bit of a corner, which was just like, oh, he's really handsome. It's kind of boring, but he's really handsome, but he's a Republican, but he's really handsome. And it was just like, then you could hire a mannequin to play this part, you know, like- You, you were could, a lawyer, right? Huh? You were a lawyer, right? I was a lawyer. I was, yeah. I was, a, I was a, a lawyer, um, yeah, I, I was- yeah, it was kind of disappointing. Yeah. Do you do you sing? Do you actually sing in real life? Um, if you get me drunk enough, I can sing anything in a karaoke mm. catalog. I was gonna <laughs> say, what's your go-to karaoke? <laughs> what's my go-to? Your go-to. Karaoke? Man, I have I've got a whole list. I will. Um, I I've got you under my skin is one that I will always sing. Oh yeah. Uh, I I love singing Neil Diamond. Classic. I said. Oh um, man, I want to hear some coming to America. Come on. <laughs> coming to America. Oh, Today. very nice. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> you gotta belt it out and like it's kind of being pulled out of you like scars. That's uh, my mother's favorite. So <laughs> um, uh, I well, yeah, Forever Blue Jeans is a good too. Money talks, but it don't sing and dance and it don't fuck. 
have you here with me? I'm a shred of beef, ribbed in blue jeans, babe. And for the listeners at home, he's not looking at the lyrics. <laughs> no, no, yeah. he's not. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> bravo, bravo. We'd like to take a second from this episode of the podcast to celebrate our sponsor of this episode, and that is the Hallmarkies Patreon. Do you love Hallmarkies podcast? Do you want an inside scoop into what happens on the podcast? Do you want early access to episodes and loads of cool perks? Now is the time to become a patron of Hallmarkies podcast. By becoming a patron, you get to access our patron Facebook group. You can request episodes or even be a guest on the podcast. And most importantly, any patron can join our monthly movie watch alongs with stars like Paul Campbell, Natalie Hall, and more. It's as low as $2 a month to join in and become a special part of the Hallmarkies family. Please consider, and we will love you forever. Go to patreon.com slash Hallmarkies. That's patreon.com slash Hallmarkies. So your first role for Hallmark was coming home for Christmas. And that one was a pretty strong start, I think, for your Hallmark career. And Uh, that's uh, an understatement. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so how did you get involved in that project? Wait a minute. Why would you say that it's a strong start? Because it was a pretty good movie, I think. Because it was fantastic. Because you've got Danica and Andrew Francis and you've got a Nina script. I mean, you can't hardly go wrong with all that and then you know you did pretty well too (laughs) (laughs) well and um well and i just watched it again for the i don't know how many time just a few days ago i'm like oh we're gonna interview neil i better watch this movie again freshen up on it (laughs) um it was um i had been approached by nina i think one other time to do um a movie that Julie Gonzalez did. Uh, oh, Pumpkin Pie Wars. Wars. Yeah, Pumpkin Pie Wars. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a good one too. <laughs> okay. um, and Nina's great, and she's like, she's so smart and funny, and uh, she's a great writer. Um, she's the first interview we ever had on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, so, we so we love Nina so much. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, so I was doing, I was doing a play at the time. Uh, mm, uh, I was doing this play that was dark. It's a really dark, like British play called uh, The Pride. Um, a heartbreaking play, but like, very dark. And um, and she was, Nina was good friends with our director and said like, oh, so the director came up to me one day. And of course, when you're doing theater, you're not making any money. <laughs> like you know, some, uh, he came up to me and was like, oh, uh, I think uh, my friend wants you for her movie. I was like, this is great. I need the money. <laughs> and so, um, so the offer came in and uh, I, you know, it kind of balked at other scripts like that in the Hallmark space, just kind of thinking, look, uh, there's not enough of a conflict here. You know, there's not enough of like a dimension to the character and some of them don't have that. And I think Nina's, Nina's really good at writing those things in. So what I saw with Robert was I think something very universal, which is sometimes, sometimes we don't like our family. <laughs> like it's hard to yeah. come home for Christmas. And we make difficult decisions regarding our family members that are not always popular. And so I think I really, I responded to that and I, I loved that element. Um, uh, our director kept yelling at me to smile more. <laughs> and it was like, and, uh, and it was like too serious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, you've written me as a serious character. <laughs> My name is Robert Bob Marley. I've invented uh, your reggaeton or whatever. <laughs> I was like, I'm the inventor of reggae music. Okay. This is that. <laughs> um, no, but it, like we, you know, it, it, it was, it was great. I, I think ultimately I, I, I loved that, uh, that role and, and, uh, and acting with Danica as well was just such a treat because we, I, I think what people don't realize about Danica is how hard she works because she makes it look so easy, right? We hear yeah. that constantly with so many of her co-stars and acting partners. They just go, she works so hard. 
Totally, totally. And, and in, in her new movie, which we'll get to, like she's she's even pulling double duty because she was our executive producer as well. But on this, she, you know, it was she's. I think what what made me feel comfortable is not like seeing somebody who's like off in a corner with a pencil, um, but as much as somebody that just that shows up and is eager to to rip apart a, a scene and not phone it in and. I've been on countless TV shows and movies where people are so self-satisfied with their process that they will just phone it in. I mean, I, I well, I'll give you an example. Like, I, I, I there was a, a movie that I did that if you're really curious, you can look up. And he was a very famous actor that uh, got all of his lines fed to him through an earpiece. And oh, uh, I know what you're talking about. Okay, right on. Well, then we can. Um, um, it, it's it's not Julia Roberts, but he might be related to her. Uh, but uh, he's, uh, he's so he's wearing an earpiece the entire time, and like you know, I I think Eric is a brilliant actor. Um, I think that when you're doing a hundred movies a year, you're going after quantity and not quality. And so I was like always just fascinated by like by this person would be like, you know, kind of like sitting there like a bobblehead, kind of like waiting for his wife to whisper his lines in his ears. And so there's that that experience on the one hand, or like somebody that's just like, that is like so interested in like their social media on the one hand. And then you get people very rarely like Danica, that is that are like so eager to try it again. There's like, ah, oh, no, there's a nuance that's kind of missed. And like, that's, I think what really separates her from, from other actors, uh, and, and not just in the Hallmark space, but in, in just in general. So we connected about that. You know, it was odd that our first moment, or the first thing we shot was the kiss at the end of the film. So we're they do that a lot. Of- they do that a lot. <laughs> why? Oh, why? Yeah. So why? They're just, yeah, right. they're just gonna throw you in the deep end of the kissing pool. And, uh, <laughs> um, but it was, it was f- fantastic. And I think that she served as a as an interpreter for between me and the director a lot when he was like smile more and she was like i i think what mel's trying to say and i'm like ah, i know what he's trying to say <laughs> um, and um but we we had a blast we really really had a blast and uh um and, and having andrew francis as your brother as your younger brother oh, we yeah, love him yeah i know like the, the golden pipes of andrew francis <laughs> um he was yeah he was a sweetheart too he was like i, I loved actually kind of winding him up in, in that movie as much as i could and like as soon as i started to kind of improv and tease him and the director didn't tell me not to i was like oh, right. this is gonna i'm be- going with it yeah, exactly exactly um but he was he was he was fantastic as well. And, and the imminent Paula Shaw. Um, oh, yeah. was like, she's, she was really fantastic as well. So it's fun. And uh, I, yeah, I, like I, I really liked making that film, but um, I think then I went to go play some, like a Nazi in something and then like play like a, like a hot food truck chef. And so I, like, I was like, it's kind of doing some other things between that and the uh, Christmas carousel. Yeah. If you had to, if you had to pick your favorite scene that you filmed in, uh, in coming home for Christmas, what, what would you say? Oh, it was that dinner table scene. Oh, uh, yeah, it was that dinner table scene where like, we were just winding things up and, and, uh, and having a hoot. Uh, that was, that was good. I mean, there are other memorable scenes that I have, like uh, when I sneak into Santa Claus or when we're springing together the popcorn. Oh, the oh, the the Santa Claus is that is the most adorable thing ever. Yeah, I just I, you cannot help but smile when you watch that scene. Oh, good, thank you. Um, I mean, <laughs> one of the scenes that actually sticks out for a different reason in my head is because it was the first time that I'd shot a seasonal film in the middle of summer. Um, oh yeah like the scene where we were outside and we meet uh, on the street and she's like she's doing some shopping and i'm yeah. like being self-serious or something and uh there the it was like 90 degrees that day we're all wearing winter clothing and i'm like sweating through this like cashmere quote uh coat and um i remember the the set decorators had kind of uh you know they like glued this wreath on one of the like the shop windows and it was so hot that it kept melting and the wreath kept falling down so we'd be shooting this scene and she'd be like and you know danica would be looking up to me with misty eyes and like 
but you never had a Christmas like that? And it's like, no, things are a bit whoomp. And you hear like <laughs> this, like this wreath wall off the side of it. And we're trying to like go, all right, think about Christmas. You're cold. It's like 30 degrees. Up. Okay, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. And they're like, back to one. All right, and action. It's like, so you never had a Christmas like that? No, not in my whoomp. Okay, back to one. Um, and, oh. Yeah, so, but it, there were there were several memorable scenes for many 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 different reasons. Well, so then your next time with Hallmark was a Christmas Carousel, oh, and right. do you did you show shoot this pretty quick after um, quarantine? Yeah, I think. Um, well, it would have been relatively quick because we shot it in. I think we're up there set. September through the beginning of November in 2020. So we, yes, yeah, so it would have been, yeah, uh, what, six months after the beginning of quarantine? Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's for some reason, Hallmark or Hallmark like uh, these, these rom coms, they see you as, as either royal or like super rich person. <laughs> you know, it's my cross to bear. Yeah. <laughs> My, you have that air about you. It's just the air of sophistication. <laughs> and my rakish good looks. My yeah, there you go. And my wit and my charm. I, you know, <laughs> um, I yeah, I, I think that, uh, I don't know. I, I think in many times in my career, I've kind of settled. I I've, Sometimes if, I, if I'm really kind of down on myself, I'll think that I'm just starting to be typecast as as people who get arrested and, and yell to some like an assistant behind their back to you know call my lawyer and i'm like well i think i think that's that's kind of what i'll be typecast as but um in these i think it was a quirk of fate that led me to play a, a prince because usually they would shoot these films in romania and i think they wanted to shoot this christmas carousel in romania i think and i think that was the plan but whatever quirk of fate led them to, to let me do a British accent in the film. I was like, yes, please. And <laughs> part of, you know, part of my petty score settling American nativist kind of uh, view of it is like the British have taken so many of our jobs. It's, it's hard. Oh, country. it's so and, unfair. You know, exactly. And Jude Law can come over to this country and use some bad American accent. And Jude Law, you're great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I was just like, I, I you know, I, I remember getting the script and they were like, oh yeah, yeah. so this movie comes in, uh, read it, let me know what you think. And, and I was like, um, and I read it and I was like, I'm a, I'm a prince. And I was like, you know, I'm probably going to have an accent for this. And then I was like, yeah. And they were like, yeah, you're going to have an accent. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. And then as soon as <laughs> we said yes, then I was just like, all right. I kind of went to work on this, like this hybrid accent of, uh, of Peter O'Toole meets Hugh Grant. And uh, I had just had a blast. And I, I kind of worked on this principle, I think because I was been stuck inside for six months, our wonderful director, Don McCutcheon, I remember, I remember, I like just drove him nuts because I would keep making things up and inventing things. And it kind of like, and I had a great time. Rachel was fantastic. And I love working with Rachel. We have a very different approach. She's very kind of like, she likes to be prepared. She likes the scene to go a certain way. I like to just make stuff up on the fly and like <laughs> and find, find bits and things like that. And uh, and one of my favorite ones didn't make it in, but I'll, I'll tell it to you guys because it's- Oh, please. It's brilliant. So the little girl is looking, my niece is kind of saying, it's like, um, Uncle Wit loves Christmas, and uh, and I was like, oh, you know, like I like Christmas traditions, and she rolls her eyes and says, every tradition is Uncle Wit's favorite uh, Christmas tradition. And, I, was, and I'm, I think the scripted line was like, oh, is that wrong, or something like that. I desperately wanted to say, and this is my, uh, I asked the director permission to say this, and he, and because I asked him permission is why he said no, and I should have just done it. But what I wanted to say is like every tradition is Uncle Wit's favorite Christmas tradition. I wanted to say, listen, babe, if loving Christmas is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Which would have been brilliant. He was like, no, yeah. we can't use that. I was like, why not? That's that's oh, whole I, no, 
Oh, I think it would have been fabulous. I could have put that on a Christmas sweatshirt and like made a million bucks. Easy. Christmas is wrong. I don't want to be right. Um, but yeah, it was like I had I had an absolute blast uh, playing Prince Whitaker. It was like it was so fun, and it, again, it was just like any idea that uh, that you could bring to the table was just like was welcome with open arms and it was like it was so much fun working on that film well now you have the winter palace coming up and now you get to play prince again (laughs) and team up with danica so it's the perfect hybrid of your hallmark movies (laughs) (laughs) exactly that's what i was saying at like christmas con to people were like who are you and i was like well, <laughs> um, I, I remember <laughs> this film, and do you remember this film? Now, what if we combine the two? Um, <laughs> I felt like I was at a pitch meeting in Hollywood. All right, so we take Neil Bledsoe. Yeah, the guy from uh, Coming Home for Christmas. Yes, we make him a prince, like in a Christmas carousel. Like, yes, but we put him back with Danica. I like it. <laughs> do you like show up at her inn or something like that? No, that's my winter palace. No, this is... <laughs> She is, she is a caretaker for the royal property. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Claudia. Um, she, by, quite by accident, she's there finishing a novel and she just needs a bit of space and getting out of Denver. So she's assured that the, the family never shows up and is usually just ensconced somewhere in Europe. And so she thinks she's got a week to just write whatever she likes. And then, of course, all hell breaks loose when Prince Henry comes to town. And he shows up at the door. He shows up at the door and he says, oh, this is my place. Yes, now you work for me. Make me some tea. Please and thank you very much. And that's pretty much the whole film, guys. Now you don't even have to see it. Um, oh, no, you I do. still want to watch it. I know. You fall in love. It's, it's great. It's fantastic. And, and we, this was truly a blessing. It was so one of the things that was what was great and like one of the ironies about quarantine, right? And I had this with Rachel in the Christmas carousel is we're stuck inside for two weeks, which just gave us this real focused time to be able to like rehearse and work things out and pitch things and like really get to know each other. So by the time that Christmas carousel, when we started to shoot Christmas carousel, Rachel and I were like, it was like, we were so ready to shoot it. It was like when you pull the, the stone back in a slingshot, you're just like, <laughs> To do it. So with this as well, uh, you know, we were both kind of Danica and I both had this this time where we were kind of quarantined up there, and we both had a bit of pre-production and some time to talk about the ideas, and we got so comfortable with it, and we were able to like really talk about what worked and what didn't work, and we um, we just we there was something about being on such a, a a small set like that we're working with uh, brad creboy's company and uh the same producer and same production team that we had on uh christmas carousel and, and in fact same place it was north bay ontario so there was a, a lot of familiarity um with the cast and crew um and danica and i had already kind of had a bit of a just a, a shorthand and how to work with each other and both of us knew that both of us are really really love to work and and there the hours when you do these things are so long but when it's fun it doesn't feel like work at all because you're working like you know you're working from the time you get up right in the morning to to drinking as much black coffee as you can going over the script learning as much as you can and and coming in and like and shooting something and hoping that it's good and then you're going home at night you're looking at your lines for the next day and preparing all that kind of stuff and so danica and i because we had had this kind of shorthand with each other just knew what to kind of expect and we were so prepared with each other but then we really started to play and we started to find some stuff that didn't work in the script. And we were like, what, what separated this movie, I think, from any other Hallmark movie is remember that story I asked you about pitching the line, but oh, listen, babe, if loving Christmas is wrong, I don't want to be right. Well, Don, I think, wanted to do it, but there is, there are, this is the difference right now between Hallmark and GAC, um, that there are less people to get approval from. And so if you have an idea like that, you're able to kind of just get it approved because there's, it's a smaller 
bureaucracy that you're dealing with when like when you're doing stuff for hallmark and hallmark i'm not taking anything away from them i'm just talking about the difference between the two is that you have to like clear an idea with like eight producers that might be asleep when you need to clear the idea you know they're, they're right in LA and they've got to email somebody else they've got to email somebody else and so a certain sense of paralysis kind of sets in to where Danica and I were on this film and we we're like, all right, this is working. Let's, can we try this? And like, we had our producer, we had our director, we would clear it with Vince in LA and that was it. He was like, great, go make, the, make it. And so by the end of this film, I was, Danica and I were making pitches in notes. Do you guys know what Final Draft Pro is? Mm -hmm. You've ever heard of it? We were making our notes in script writing software in Final Draft Pro and we were, we had, we rewrote the last two scenes of the film, not like a complete, like, hey, this sucks, we're gonna throw it out, but just taking some of these brilliant ideas that our writers already kind of had that just weren't as fleshed out, that by, by us being on the ground with each other, Danica and I trusting each other with the incredible freedom that our producers and our director had given us, we were able to really put as much of ourselves in this movie. And so every day coming to set just felt like, man, this is incredible. We just get to live as creatively and as spontaneously as we can to try to make the best thing that we can. And this is like, this is why, I mean, Danica will say this, hopefully because she's flattering me, but no, she's, I mean, she's on record now saying that this of any show, any movie she's ever done, no matter what it is, is the thing that she had the most fun on. And I don't think that's mm -hmm. just lip service. It's because both of us were able to put so much of ourselves in it great that's fantastic uh, yeah i wasn't <laughs> always planned was what was that that remains to be seen if it's yeah. <laughs> um was it always planned to be a winter movie or was it a christmas movie then they changed it over um i'm not sure i you know gac is so new um you know we, they only made the announcement in september so uh, i i think i i'm Truth be told, I'm not sure how many original films that they had made themselves. Uh, I think part of their Christmas slate was bought. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure the ins and outs of the business. Um, but this is either, you know, when Danica announced her deal, uh, moving over there for her, her deal, she's part of that is being a, an executive producer as well. And all that kind of means for people that aren't too familiar with the business is that you're kind of, she was my boss. Um, she, she literally <laughs> was, uh, but that you get to, you have a certain amount of creative input that like, you know, my creative input kind of really starts when I'm acting in the film, you know, when I'm like, when I'm on set, I'm saying my own lines, but I'm, I'm not going to rewrite somebody else's and kind of move around some pieces, but because this is really her name on it, she has a lot of, she has a lot of equity in it. She has a lot of stake in it. So when they made the announcement of her her movies, I was very flattered that the first person she thought of and wanted to work with was me. And she actually called me before she even made the announcement for GAC. And I hope I won't get in trouble for this, but she she said, hey, you know, this isn't announced yet. Please keep it to yourself because I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't want to jinx it, but uh, I'm thinking of making this move and, I, and uh, you'll be the only person I, you know, first person I thought of when I wanted to make this movie. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, of course. Nice. So I, th and I think then, you know, now that I'm thinking through it, I think that it was always planned to be not a Christmas film because she had a Christmas film for Hallmark, but it was mm -hmm. always going to be like in the new year for GAC. So um, yeah, that's, uh, I yeah, I, I, I'm trying to imagine it now as a Christmas film. It was like, I guess it would just be called the Christmas Palace, but. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And this was filmed in Ontario, you said? Yeah, we filmed it in North Bay. Cool, cool. Yeah. Was it in the summer again? No, 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 no. We filmed it in uh, uh, all of November. So it was actually- Oh, thank cool. heavens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Uh, no, we really got to, yeah. So that cold you see, no, that's real cold. Um, it, You're shivering for real this time. <laughs> it's always nice when you don't have to act that and it's like 90 degrees out and you're doing this with your hands or like, yeah. I've actually seen it on a couple films. They'll like, they'll use CGI to like do somebody's breath. And I'm like, yeah. oh, God, that looks awful. That yeah. looks awful. I agree. Yeah, it's, it doesn't look great. <laughs> no, no, yeah. it doesn't. No, it, it was weird too, because actually we were shooting in, 
No, we were we were shooting in North Bay, and Rachel and Trevor Donovan were shooting in uh, in Colorado at the time. That's and right. And it was just like, why are these guys using our sets? And we're like, we're supposed to be in Colorado. Um, <laughs> but it was cool. Very good. Well, we're excited for the new movie. Congratulations, and thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And and for people that don't know where to find us, uh, you know, we're I think most cable providers have TAC, um, uh, but uh, it's also on um, Hulu Live. It's on if you have any trouble uh, with the, the cable stuff, you can, I think there's a phone number for GAC uh, to find the network, but it's on, it's on uh, Spectrum, it's on Time Warner, it's on, um, uh, I don't have cable myself, so I'm trying to rack through which cable channels, but I think it's, it's on all of your normal cable channels. But if you have any trouble doing that, um, it is also streaming on Friendly, on Fubo and on Hulu Live as well. So. Yeah, and it's also on IMDb uh, TV actually. I on there, so uh, okay. you can watch it on there if you want. Uh, but um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I really appreciate it. And where can people like find you if they want to follow you on social media, all that fun stuff? Oh, you got to come to because I bled so and <laughs> join the party and. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and if you like my photography, you can go to Recycled Sympathy Cards. Um, but uh, yeah, it's because I bled so all across your dials. Right. Why? Because I bled so. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> we'll have all that in the description. <laughs> you can check out Neil. But thank you so much for coming. I, we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> Bye. So, Cami, how can people reach you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Cami Drama Girl, and you can find me on Hardy's Hotline and the Hooked Hardy Facebook page. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. So please take a look at that and make sure you're following the podcast at Hallmarkies Pod and Hallmarkies Podcast, all of our social media. And if you are listening on iTunes, please leave your ratings and reviews. We so appreciate it. And if you are watching on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that so much. We also have the patron group and merch store. And so please take a look at that. All the information's in the description. So thanks so much to Neil. We had a great time talking with him. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we'll talk to y'all later. Bye everyone. Bye guys.